This video brought to you by our Patreons. Please consider supporting this channel and joining our Patreons at patreon.com forward slash NovaWing24. Hi there folks, my name is NovaWing24 and welcome to a Microsoft Flight Simulator tutorial video slash information video. So it's launch week, it's been a busy week for everybody and we've been all coming to grips with the future of simulation as Microsoft Flight Simulator is. Now as part of that, um, I did during the preview series, I did cover off some of the cool new features that were coming to Microsoft Flight Simulator, in, especially in the settings and some of the settings menu and some of the options. Now a few things have changed since the preview build that we looked at to what was finally released to us in the public. So what I wanted to do is I wanted to take some time and come back and actually re-look at everything that has changed as part of this sim and all the content and all the new things that are there and some of the cool features and just generally go through a bit of in-depth explanation of what is uh, of what a lot of the, the content is in the in the options menu and especially some of the stuff for, to people who might be new to flight simulation um, so before it gets started, I do want to say a huge thank you to Microsoft and, Austra and Xbox Australia New Zealand for providing me with the copy of Microsoft Flight Simulator that we are working with today. And uh, we're going to go through, as I said, we're going to go through, this is a long video guys, so um, I will attempt to remember to put some bookmark timestamps in the description if, you, if there is a specific section you want to look at. But we are going to be taking our time, this is going to be very in depth, so uh, settle in, grab your drink, grab some popcorn, and we're going to be here for a while. Alright, so as I said, this is about the options that is available to us in our new flight simulator. So let's jump into said options menu. Alright, so we're going to go through these in the three distinct parts that we have here in our options menu. Um, so the first one is we're going to start with general. So with our general tab, uh, we've got a various different side tabs down the side here and we'll go through these each one at a time. Starting with, of course, graphics, which, you know, is kind of fairly important for a flight simulator. Now, a lot of these settings are settings that you would be familiar with for pretty much any game out there in the world. Um, it's, it's it, They're pretty, pretty obvious, as it were. You can actually change your mode, you know, your display mode from window to full screen or you know, vice versa. Same with the resolution, you can change uh, the resolution scaling. Um, the, the sim supports all the way up to 4K resolution. Uh, I currently run it on a 1920-1080 monitor, so that is the resolution that I use. Uh, you have the option to use HDR, um, if that supports it as well. Um, and then we've got this sort of global rendering quality here. So this is basically a set of um, presets for everything else down here as well. A couple of them are excluded, excluded and we'll show those off in a second. Um, but you can sort of skip through here. When you first launch the sim, it will actually go through, it'll test your hardware and give you a recommended option. Um, so far for me, I've gone with the recommended option for me, which was the high end. There is one that is higher than this, which is um, uh, Ultra but I'm, uh, I didn't end up actually using that one because at the end of the day, this one I said, this was the one that was recommended to me and this is the one that I've gone with and this is everything that you guys have been seeing since the um, uh, couple of days immediately prior to launch when we started being able to stream content. All right, so let's go through some of the advanced settings down here. Now, as I said, most of these are controlled by or are set by the global rendering to quality um, preset. A couple of them though you can change independently. The main obvious one being the frame rate limiter. That one is the one that you can actually change. Now speaking of, I did change that. So originally that was set to unlimited. Um, but I've set mine to 30. Now I want to have a bit of a, a conversation about this because I feel sometimes that we seem to get hung up on a number. And I do not chase a number. And I want to talk to you about why that is. I chase an experience. I chase a smooth, consistent, immersive experience. I do not chase a number. The fact is, is that, um, especially at 1920 by, uh, 1920 by 1080, the difference between 30 frames per second and 60 frames per second for the human eye to see is minimal at best. At the end of the day, I would rather go with 
30 frames, 40 frames, then, you know, and know that it's a consistent, reliable, stable experience than to have spikes and peaks and troughs and things like that. The other thing is, guys, is that unless you're using, unless you're using VR, you fundamentally don't really need more than 30 FPS. As I said, the human eye can barely detect it. Um, now, if we're talking first person shooters, sure, okay, chase a number as much as you like. But as last time I checked, a first person shooter doesn't cover the whole world from sea level all the way up to 200,000 feet. So, do you really need 144 frames per second of which you will barely be able to note, be able to tell, your brain cannot, could barely process 114 of those frames. So, I really, as I said, VR, slightly different story. If you're in VR, absolutely, you need to go for sort of 40 frames per second as a minimum um, to be able to avoid nausea issues and stuff like that. So absolutely, I, I have a you know justification for that. But seriously, 30 frames per second, guys, you don't need any more than that. You really don't. And you're better off if you lock your frames to 30, you know, or even 60, and let your, let your system get your rig let your sim focus on other tasks in the sim you're going to have a better experience overall so i just want to have that that's a big conversation that i think that we as a community need to have we need to stop trying to chase a number because chasing number you get tunnel vision and you actually miss out on what you're doing if if i'm having an ex you know, if, if i'm having an if i'm flying in the cockpit of an aircraft and the frames are only 25 frames per second but i can I can't tell because everything else is smooth as silk. I really don't care. And I really don't think we as a community should either. Yes, okay, absolutely. If something's you know hogging your frames and it's becoming a slideshow, as I've experienced with a couple of other settings that we'll talk about coming up uh, during this video, that yeah, absolutely, that's a problem. But guys, if it's doing 30 frames per second, hell, even 25 frames per second, you don't really have much of an issue so unless as i said unless you're in vr so i just want to talk about that and tell you guys about that because yeah that's that's a thing all right either way if you did want to change it though you can go through several different um so yeah you can look at the twitch so you, you, yeah, bleh, you don't have a sliding scale you've got presets to do so 20 30 or 60 um is your sort of frame limit cap so i do apologize when i said unlimited before i meant to say 60 frames per second when i first started uh, but yeah, I kept mine at 30 and I have a great experience. So yeah, I just, that's, that's my thing there. All right, going through quickly through some of these options, as I said, um, again, a lot of these are going to be fairly familiar to anybody who's any kind of, any kind of 3D graphics. Um, as a general rule, as I said, what the preset sets you to is going to be pretty good. Um, a lot of work I went in under the hood of sort of tweaking this sim and getting it right and I think you'll be pleasantly surprised um, but again if you're going to tweak with it absolutely tweak to your heart's content but just one word of warning though if you're going to do it you know read the little tool tips on the side here and also make sure that when you change things only change one thing at a time and then repeat your test until you find the best system that the best set of settings that work for you um, going through here, these uh, four here are sort of uh, to related to what you actually sort of see around you. Um, also these five. So the terrain level of detail, this has to do with the quality of the mesh. Uh, terrain vector data, that has to do with things like uh, roads, rivers, railway lines, edges of lakes, edges of oceans, um, things like that. So this is just how, how accurate this is and how much how the quality, of, like how smooth the lines are on the edge of the coast. So for example, where the water masking is. So when you transition from the ground part of the texture into the ocean at, uh, on a beach, um, how smooth that line is and that transition is, that's where this is set. The higher this is, the smoother that transition will be. Uh, buildings, again, the visual quality, basically the higher number of textures and the higher number of buildings that will be rendered in the sim. Trees, same deal, more high that is, the more trees will be rendered in your sim, the higher the quality of the tree textures. And grass and bushes, again, same deal, 
the more the higher this is the more you'll see once you get down to level uh, once you get down to that altitude and get up close and personal now another thing to talk about these as well is that this sys this sim is a, is smart in its rendering of this data it has the data there but it will only render it when it enters your field of vision and it's fairly intelligent with how it does so it won't your data is your buildings and your content won't pop into existence. It will fade in and it will fade in um, sort of correctly. Um, so it it will and it will unload things that it doesn't need to render, which is again a really great uh, sort of fairly smart feature of this sim. It's been in other sims as well, well in in, in various degrees of success, um, but this one I think has done it really, 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 really well. Uh, objects level of detail pretty much related to the buildings one as well uh, volumetric clouds basically like, again the quality of the texture of the clouds overall texture res resolution um, of the sim the max text texture resolution uh, anti ice filtering again a lot of this stuff is things that many of experienced flight simmers have been sort of using uh, via the Nvidia sort of profile Nvidia graphic settings or the AT the AMD equivalent um, so it's great to see that this kind of stuff is now actually um, brought into the sim directly, so we can actually control it directly in the sim. Um, waves. So this is the level and the level and the quality of the wave simulation. Um, so you will actually see rolling waves when you are on the surface of the water or overflying the water, and this is the quality and the level of detail that that wave simulation has. Shadows. Do uh, have the quality of the shadows? Are shadows there? Stuff like that. Um, the contact shadows as well, this is a really interesting one as well. So this is sort of how the shadows in, interplay, especially in things like uh, when sim objects interact with each other. Um, that's pretty damn, like it, it is, it's just, it's just amazing. Like I just want to give an example here. I was doing a multiplayer flight recently uh, with some friends and I was in the VL3 and I'm flying along and then above my head passes another player in a Baron and I actually watched his, sh his Baron's shadow play across my cockpit as he went over like and the, the crispness of the shadow that, that goes across that that's what that is windshield effects uh, again uh, pretty it's sort of kind of it says what it says it does what it says on the Tim this is the quality of the rain effects on the windshield uh, obviously the higher it is the, the the more detailed things like the the splashing off the as the rain hits the windshield and how the water droplets collect and flow across the aircraft is in terms of the airflow. Uh, Ambient occlusion reflections, uh, again, pretty standard stuff, bloom set of stuff. Light shafts, light shafts. Now this is a one that I really, this is one of those things that really sets this, again, one of those many visual things that sets this sim apart from others. Um, so light shafts has to do with the play of light coming through from different layers of cloud. So if you have uh, some different layers of cloud and you know you're flying along underneath the cloud and um, you know say, say it's a fairly dark you know fairly overcast kind of day uh, but you know it's, but it's the middle of the day and then you pass through an area where there's a hole in the clouds this was where this is the quality of that light shaft that will come through uh, will it just reflect on the ground or will you actually sort of see that sort of particleized in, in the air as it goes you fly through it um, this one if possible always have this one high or ultra like seriously it's amazing uh, bloom, a light bloom, death field, and question again. This is sort of obvious stuff, leaving that one alone. These two settings here are settings that will play into your sim experience and also in terms of your, uh, some of the, uh, will, will potentially pay off high dividends for performance um, if you need them, if, if you need to sort of find some extra frames at all. So first off is um, using generic models for AI traffic. So this first one refers to, um, so, so AI traffic refers to procedurally generated AI traffic and also to flight aware supplied AI traffic is what this refers to. So this is, uh, will it use the high fidelity um, approximations uh, or the high fidelity models that we can fly or will it use a, there's a stack of generic uh, aircraft models that are included with the sim. So will it use those or will it use the high fidelity ones? Uh, by default, this is set to on and I would recommend that you leave it set to on. Uh, the other one that is uh, here is uh, generic, use generic plane models for multiplayer. So this one refers to other human players. 
So when you are flying in, multi in multiplayer, you're flying on the servers and you see other uh, fellow virtual aviators flying Microsoft Flight Simulator, um, will it display their aircraft, their actual aircraft, as it is in, um, you know, they're, they're, so if they're flying a Cessna 172 with a G1000 cockpit, will you see a Cessna 172 with a G1000 G1000 cockpit, or uh, if they're flying the 787-10, will you see them in a 787-10? Um, or will it swap it out for you know the Cessna for a generic low poly, um, you know low detail, low poly single engine prop? Uh, will it you know substitute that 787 for a twin engine jetliner? So that's that's what that one is. Now this one. If you're in an area with a lot of multiplayer, like a lot of human players flying around, um, you are, at least I definitely, and everybody I've talked to so far, does notice the performance hit. So if you, it's one of those things, it's a really tough call because we really wanna see what everybody else is flying, especially because this sim carries across so much data between the sims. Like, you know, when you see their ailerons move and their flaps move, their, you know, their lights turn on off, you see all of that clearly in the sim. They ask that data is synced clearly. So you want to see that, but at the same time, if it's making your sim unflyable, you may want to consider switching. So that's a, an important uh, one to talk about. And uh, it also has an impact on something else, which we'll talk about in a minute as well. So that's the graphics page of our general tab here. So moving on to the camera. So this is um, fairly obvious settings here um so you've got three main cameras and this one talks about two of them and also um a couple of sort of sub cameras so the three main cameras in the sim are the cockpit cameras the um chase camera and then the uh, special camera or drone camera uh, within the cockpit camera you also have the in the uh, sort of an instruments view mode so camera selection, um, so this will you know, change the actual camera. Um, so what's the default camera that you want to load in at? So if, you, if you're going for, you know, I would recommend you always have leaving it set to the cockpit, but if you want a default set to always fly on the outside of the aircraft, that is perfectly fine. Then you can change that default here to chase. Uh, quick view function is sort of with a certain quick view um, uh, presets for each aircraft. Uh, you can actually, so, does it, is it a toggle or is it hold? So if you press the number key that that's assigned to, if you, to go to that view, if you press and hold it, will it there? Or if you press it once, it'll go there, press it again to come back to the default view. Smart camera, smart camera is a, an interesting one. Um, I haven't used it a lot, um, but it is interesting. Uh, this one is sort of probably, uh, there's actually an achievement for actually this one as well, by the way, uh, of using the smart camera to look at things like points of interest, like, um, you know, the Shard, the Big Ben, stuff like that. So you can, again, for the smart camera, either toggle or press and hold to activate the smart camera. Um, I need to check to see how well that plays with Track IR because I think, because I know there was a similar kind of thing in missions in the ESP, in the base, in the old legacy ESP sims, and it never worked very well with Track IR. So it'd be interesting to see how this one works with Track IR. Uh, zoom function. Pretty much does what it says on the tin. Uh, does is the zoom automatic or manual? Um, so, if you leave it set to manual, then the by default the scroll wheel on your mouse will control the zoom. If you set to focus, then if you right click on this area of the screen, uh, and there's an instrument um, or a gauge there under where you right click, the camera will zoom into that into that area. Um, and then right click again to actually sort of to, to release that. So interesting function probably, uh, and, and I can see how it would be very useful. So yeah, that is kind of cool and interesting. Um, and focus mode, again, similar kind of deal. Um, this sets the, again, do you toggle it or do you press and hold to get the focus mode in, like on, in on a instrument? All right, moving to our copper camera. Um, 
pretty obvious stuff. So again, base thing, is it basically, uh, is it the standard sort of pilot seat camera? Again, this is the default camera. So is it a d default, is it like a high camera? Is it uh, the basic sort of generic pilot seat one? Or is it a, um, you know, you're leaned in looking at instruments. There's a three different ones that you can start to set to. You can change these at any time during the, um, yeah, in the sim, you can sort of switch between these. But yeah, this is just the default one that it first loads you in at. Uh, free look mode, is it toggle or not? Uh, again, pretty easy. Is it toggle or do you press and hold to do it? So by default, I think it is, I want to say it's middle mouse button. Um, and by default, it's toggle. So you sort of tap the middle mouse button, move your mouse around to look around, especially if you don't have track IR, and then press the mouse, middle mouse button again to let go. And it'll just leave you in that view. Uh, free look reset. So does it, after you move your that said view around, do you have, does it automatically snap you back to the default camera up here? Or does it uh, require you to sort of manually click a button or press a shortcut key to bring you back? Uh, head up mode. Um, so this is sort of like a, uh, again, it's sort of like a, the, to do with the uh, camera selection, sort of like a, a head up sort of, you know, when you're coming in for landing. This one here, height, horizontal position adjustment. This is based off the um, default. So it's a percentage based off wherever the default camera is set by the uh, flight, the aircraft's configuration files. Zoom speed, how quickly does your zoom go zoom in, zoom out. Free look speed, how quickly does it move? How much is momentum is there? So that's pretty much it. Um, okay, so these ones here are kind of cool as well as so camera shake. Uh, so camera shake, so does your camera shake um, when you're going through things like when you're turning, when you're moving, when you're banking, when you're rolling across the bumps, lumps and bumps in the uh, in the ground? Uh, is it, uh, I, do you, does the camera simulate that movement? Um, I do not see why you would want to turn that off. Um, but, you know, if you do, if you do want to turn it off, you can. And I definitely feel that this is one of the, uh, the way they've modeled the camera shake in this is far better than I've seen in any other sim. So yeah, I'm definitely leaving it on. Uh, flashlight modes. Flashlight mode's interesting. So it's got a, um, there is a torch uh, in the sim uh, that especially if you're starting up aircraft cold and dark at night without an airport without lighting, um, you're going to need that. Uh, so there is a keyboard command, but this also sets whether or not that it automatically turns on uh, if you load into the aircraft cold and dark. So that's a kind of neat little thing, but make sure you know your control keybind for that one. Uh, instrument view mode, again, as I said, pretty much very, very similar. Again, instrument view mode essentially is uh, like a, uh, we talked about it briefly earlier. Um, it's when you go sort of, do you, you know, toggle the button when your mouse is holding over an instrument and it'll zoom into that. Uh, and then whether also, um, so you can also, or you can set it to, uh, and you also set it to, will it automatically do it? So if you, um, put your mouse over like the area where a, um, instrumentation is in the cockpit, will it automatically zip in there or do you have to manually press the key to go through to those different views? All right, finally we have the chase camera setting here in this one. Um, so a lot of people of course have seen many, many of the videos. There's a lot of videos kicking around of this and a lot of screenshots kicking around of this where you have the, um, the, the external view of the aircraft where you can still control the aircraft because that's something we're going to talk about with the drone camera. Um, so the chase camera is you, you can still you can see the outside of the aircraft and the beautiful scenery and you can still control the aircraft from outside, but you have all the overlay of all the gauges, so your airspeed, uh, your altitimeter, your altitude, um, all that kind of stuff. That's called the heads up display, just in case you didn't know. Um, permanently on or do you want to turn it off? There you go. That's it. On, off, toggle, done. Really, really easy. Um, not rocket science. And you can change this mid-flight as well if you want to. You can do that as well. Uh, point of view reset. So when you're in the chase camera view, do you, once you, if you do rotate the view or if you do move the view, um, does it automatically snap back or do you have to press a key in order to get to reset back? Um, I would highly recommend you leave this set to manual unless otherwise you want to continue holding your thumbstick down when you want to look at a different certain way. And finally, zoom, speed, momentum. Again, pretty obvious stuff. Not really going to go through those. And there is all of our camera settings. All right, moving from there, we move into the sound. Now, this one's a, a couple of interesting ones with this one as well. So, first off, this is um, like, okay, okay, well, let's probably do the, the, the volume levels. Volume levels, that's pretty obvious. I'm not really going to go into that. I'm really not there. They're self-explanatory. They, self they do exactly what they say on the tin. Um, there's a couple of settings here, though, that I do want to talk about. 
So the first one is communication selection. So this is have been has been improved definitely. So there are now three settings here. So the default setting is um, all audio comes out through your main system speakers. Okay, and by the way, folks, everything in the sound here is all driven by Windows, by your operating system, and how your sound devices are set up in that. So by default, it will come out that everything will come out through the single audio device. You then have a headphone simulation where um, it applies a, where it literally it says on the as well, is simulation of headphone acoustics, i.e., like you are inside the aircraft with your head with your Bose headphones on, flying the airplane, um, and it will adjust other sounds based on that. So you will mute, it will not mute, but it will reduce the sounds of the externals, you know, of the engines and stuff like that, based on you wearing headsets. This is the setting that I normally use, and then uh, sorry, and then but it routes everything sort of via your headphones. Then it doesn't route anything by your main speakers. Um, this one is communication airport, and this one's uh, the one that I really the like that I will always use. And uh, if anybody's tuned in my live streams, this is what you would have heard me use. So this one is plays your external like environment, cockpit, engine sounds, all that kind of stuff, good stuff. It gets played through your main speakers, your default speakers. But then all your communications on the radio, however, all of those will come through your uh, headphones. So yeah, if you're using a set of headphones, then this is gonna be the setting that I would probably recommend using is either this one or the headphone simulation would be the one to use. Funny, and the other main one that I wanna show off is the VHF signal de degradation. Uh, so this is really interesting. So in the real world, with so radio signals, they don't they not they don't necessarily have to perform line of sight, but they degrade. The quality of the communications degrade if they're not if you don't if you the further you are away from the signal source, and if the more things that are in the way between you and the signal source, then the quality of it does degrade. It gets to be rubbish. That's you know, the reason why people talk about you know you know, you know how are you reading me. 5x5, 3x5, 2x5, whatever, or those kind of levels. So this sim actually models that natively. So it takes the weather data, it takes the terrain data that you're flying over, it looks at where that, that communication signal is starting from, looks at where you are, and looks at what's in between you. And the more rubbish that's in between you, the worse it's going to sound and harder it's going to be to hear what the AI, what the ATC is saying, or the other aircraft is saying. And that is a huge deal for a flight simulation. Um, but some people may not like it, and you can turn it off, that's fine. Now, to give you an example of where I actually sort of really felt and heard this happening in the sim was I was doing a flight um, uh, just after launch, and we were flying we were flying around the big island of Hawaii. Now, I we were leaving Hilo, and we were crossing to the other side of the island um, via uh, Mauna Kea, and we to head down towards... Um, head down towards Kona. Now, took off from Hilo, and so I was handing communications with Hilo Tower and then Hilo Approach, and all fine because the tower's right there, so we're really crystal clear, instant, instant communication. Once I leave, left Hilo, Hilo Approach's airspace, I moved into Honolulu Center's airspace. Honolulu Center is three islands away. Um, so the Big Island of Hawaii, uh, the Island of Hawaii, uh, the Big Island, or also known as the Big Island of Hawaii, is at one end of the chain, and uh, the Island of Oahu, where Honolulu is, is in the middle of the chain. So it's a long way away. And when I was handed over to them, I actually, you know, the the the, the sound quality, the, the the radio quality was chalk and cheese, night and day. Like it was scratchy, it was rough, it was crackly, and it's like, but that's what it would be like. And that is so adds so much to the immersion factor. Is ATC perfect with this sim? No, but having stuff like that happen to it makes it amazing. It really does. Uh, finally, another couple of minor ones to tick off here: uh, text to speech settings. Text to speech settings. Uh, so it can either be processed. So this is like to do with your ATC um, text to speech. So is this powered by Azure, uh, by the in the cloud, or is it powered by just your sim uh, by your language pack? Uh, so um. Don't read. So I, I believe that it's, apparently it says the quality is better when it's in on Azure. I honestly don't know. I've only ever run it with Azure. I never tried it with the Windows offline mode. But I do know that you do require to have the uh, Microsoft Eng uh, US English language pack installed for this sim, which has something to do with that. So yeah. But if you again, it was one of those options where you can still. It means you can fly completely offline because you can do it locally online, uh, offline. 
funny music selection. This is a quirky little one, this one. So this is, so there are three different sets of music tracks um, in here. So the first one is the one that we've all come to know and love, the default one here. Very, very bright and colorful set of soundtrack. The second one that we have is color two. Um, this one's really interesting from a musical perspective is um, it's a lot, like the color one is very bright and, and, and full of hope and bright and it's exciting. Um, color two, is a lot more interest feels a lot more introspective and thoughtful and 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 I think earthy is probably the right term for it. Um, so it makes a nice little change every now and again to be able to switch to this uh, to this uh, sound pack. So I think overall I still prefer color one, um, but yeah, color two is uh, not bad. It has a moment. Now, finally, there is a third option though, which is for the old timers, the classic legacy FSX soundtrack has been brought to life, remastered and brought to life here in the new scene. I've had enough of hearing this soundtrack, so I'm happy to hit with, sit with uh, Color 1, but there you go, there are some options available for you if you want. Cool, and as I said, I'm not going to go through these building levels because they do what they say on the tin. Alright, moving on to our next one. Now the traffic um, tab here is where you will potentially get your biggest hits and also on, on your system performance and also where you'll gain the most system performance is on this page funnily enough so first things first is uh your ai traffic types so um three main types for this one so this controls your non-human um fellow denizens of the sky so first one the one by default is real-time online so real-time online is so uh, this sim is fed by data from online um flight monitoring software like flight aware and um, flight radar it is delayed anything up to 10 minutes sort of five to ten minutes delay between the real life real world and what you see but you know it's still you know pretty good and this is actual actual call signs you know actual aircraft types um, generically represented the sim in, in the sim but still it's you know real call signs doing real approaches you know everything is real so that's pretty cool to have. Now the other one, the next step option is AI offline where it doesn't use any real world information. It just uses um, sort of you know, auto generates. And then when you move to that AI offline, that's where these sliders come alive. And you set, you know, what, how much, how much traffic do you want to have in your skies? You know, you, you set and control that one. Uh, finally, the other option is off where there is just you and anybody else playing in multiplayer, that's it. I personally like flying with real-time online traffic. I, I, I do, it's something different. Show traffic nameplates um, is interesting, this one. So this one is, it's you know, obviously it's on or off, it's pretty it's simple, um, but this not just doesn't just affect AI traffic, this affects multiplayer users as well. So if you wanna see the gamer tag of the person that you're wanting to fly with or the people who are flying with you, turn this on. Um, a few people have asked is that can you change the color and the sizing and stuff like that. Unfortunately, it seems not at this stage. It's you're just stuck with a sort of gray background with a white text. That's it. End description. And it's it pops up. It's a fairly long distance that you can see it away from. Uh, but if you get too close to the person, sort of you know within a you know few meters, then it will disappear. Um, I'm going to skip over these three for a second because I want to come back to those. Um, then. But the, these three on the bottom here, for anybody who's been using the ESP sims for a while, you'd recognize these. These haven't changed. They do exactly what they say on the tin, same as pre legacy sims. Ships and ferries, so this is your large boats. So your large ships, your container ships, your fuel tank, your, you know, your oil tankers that uh, roam the high seas or with large ferries. This is where you control the level of traffic for that. Road vehicles, roads, uh, the, the higher this slider, the more cars on your roads and the more cars so it'll start you know it's over highways you know then primary roads secondary roads tertiary roads the higher that number is the more ground traffic is going to appear leisure boats so this is like your sail boats your pleasure boats and when you see them stuff around like that uh okay airport life okay two of these sliders are new um and one of them has a massive impact on your sim experience Ground vehicle density hasn't changed. That is uh, same as it was in Legacy Sim. So this is the number of amount of ground service equipment around in your airport. So the number of baggage carts, the number of fuel trucks around the airport, the number of pushback vehicles, the number of safety vehicles, follow me trucks, stuff like that. Uh, higher this number, the more of them there will be, but yeah, 20-ish percent. Oh, by the way, all of six of these start at 50%. Um, 
20-ish percent is more than enough. Um, worker density is things like your uh, so your uh, willing uh, populated people that roam around the airport, that walk around the airport, looking for to help you park and stuff like that. This is where you know the number of those is controlled. Now, finally, we have ground aircraft density. Now, this one is probably, as I said, this is the biggest potential performance hit and the biggest potential performance saver. When you go to an airport in real life, there are a lot of aircraft there. A lot of aircraft that are just sit there, sitting there parked. They are not flying that day or they're not flying for another you know, 12, 12, 18 hours. Uh, they're just parked on the ramp. They're just living there. They're parked over there overnight or they might be down for maintenance or whatever reason. But it's a, an airport is very rarely ever empty. What this slider attempts to do is attempts to fill up parking slots, parking you know, ramp slots, gates with traffic that you wouldn't necessarily see. So particularly like for example using in conjunction with real time online traffic. It's aircraft that would just simply be parked there that you wouldn't necessarily see otherwise. Um, what this basically does is it takes the percentage that you set this to and then looks at the airport that you're that's around you. That, that looks at an airport, looks at the number of gates and ramps there and goes right how many of these do I fill with just aircraft that have no purpose, they're not going to fly anywhere, they're just going to sit there on the ramp. How many of those slots do I allocate to those AI, to those, you know, stationary aircraft? As I said, by default, that's at 50%. During a one of my preview live streams of the release version of this, uh, we flew in, we flew in Alaska and with our end destination of uh, Ted Stevens International at in Anchorage. Now, Ted Stevens International, there's surrounding Ted Stevens International, there are three fairly large airports. When we approach, when we sort of entered the airspace of that area and it started rendering the airports and the, the airport and started loading in the traffic, it loaded 280 of the high fidelity aircraft simultaneously. And this was a slider set at 50% across three large, medium to large airports. It it crashed the scene. It killed it. Um, at other airports, like when I was flying out of KSFO, I got single digit frames um, and made it unflyable because over you know 50% of the parking slots and gates were filled with trapped with these high fidelity aircraft that were not going anywhere. That were just sitting there taking up space. As soon as I changed, dropped this slider down lower, all those problems went away. My frames resumed, I didn't take the hit. Did the airports look a little less busy because of that? Yes, they did. I'll take that trade off, thank you. I am perfectly happy to take that trade off. Um, what it appears to do is it appears to take, you may recall that in our graphic settings, we talked about the use generic, you know, plane models for AR traffic, use generic uh, models for multiplayer. It seems to be driven by the multiplayer setting in terms of um, what it spawns in for this slider. So, because I be I I would re I really appreciate I prefer to have real human players uh, appearing as the aircraft they're actually flying in, then um, it appears to say which means that this setting is also going to spawn in with a high high fidelity aircraft as well. So. I highly recommend that you drop this setting down from the 50% it starts at, and I have to reckon that you sit it down less than 10. I have it sitting at 5, I'm probably going probably gonna to bump it back up to 10, um, but yeah, seriously, I'd rather take the slight, a slight immersion hit for actually being able to fly everywhere. So, But yeah, this that setting there, I think out of everything I'm going to show you today, that setting there is going to give you the most bang for your buck uh, in terms of performance. Alright, and that is the traffic tab sorted. All right, on to our data tab. Now, this one is one that is um, really, really important and has got a couple of really important things going on here. All right, so we know that this sim is driven very heavily by data. Um, it streams a lot of its um, satellite imagery um, as it goes, in photogrammetry data, stuff like that. It streams a lot of it as it goes. Um, it has live real-world weather, live real-world traffic, you know, multiplayer, all that kind of stuff. So on. You can turn all of that off with a simple click of a switch, click off, and you're done. 
Like, that's it. Like, you can just turn it off. You can fly this sim completely offline if you so desire. You absolutely can. So, it is one of those things where... But you can, if you want to do certain... Remove certain things. So, if you want to go with just geotypical te textures and not use the photo real scenery, just turn that off. Or the photogrammetry of certain cities that have uh, a full photo real building supported, such as Newcastle, that we did tour in our preview tour of Newcastle, or the city of Canberra, um, or a couple of other cities around the world, you can turn those off. And so it just uses normal AI buildings there. Live real air traffic, same deal. Live weather, same deal. Multiplayer, so the ability to fly with fellow aviators then you can turn that off as well. So you can turn, you can do an all or nothing, or you can change it individually as you go along. Uh, down here as well, you also have your data consumption. So at this point, we are, a, I've been using this sim now for, at the time of making this video, just over a week. Um, and I've used five gig of data and I've been flying, you know, eight hours plus a day, you know, six to eight hours a day. Uh, and that's where I, and that's the amount of data I've used. Um, it allows you to reset, they like set what data allow, what the data tracking resets. So that I've got to set for the first of every month because that's when my service provider resets my data plans. But I also have an unlimited data plan, so I don't really care. Data limitations, so this allows you to sort of set, you know, if you have um, a data limit that you want to have, you can actually set this. So you can go set it on and you say, how many gigs per month do you want to limit Microsoft Flight Simulator to be able to use in total? Okay, and also implement a warning. So when you get to a certain amount of data, will it flash up a warning on the screen and tell you that and allow you to take options like turn data off and stuff like that. Bandwidth usage limit also allows you to limit how much of your bandwidth is tied up using this. Um, so for example, you can limit it to five megabits per second, 20 meg per second, 40 meg per second, or unlimited. Um, it's only me and two cats in the house, so I'm happy with leaving it to unlimited. But if you've got a family, this might be something that you might want to check and change on here as well. Now, rolling cache. Rolling cache basically is that if you fly somewhere, it will download that data and store it on your hard drive. This allows you to set the location of where this goes to or where this is stored and how much data you want to be able to keep in that rolling cache. As it fills up, once it gets towards the size, its size limit, it will delete the oldest data that you haven't used for the longest period of time. Okay, it'll remove that data to make room for new data and it just rolls along like that. The best, best and most important thing with this is that you can set the place on the location on your hard drive or where that's going to be stored. By default, that's stored in your app data folder of your C drive, but I suggest changing it. I add it to a separate folder inside my Flight Sims installation folder and it just sits there and chills. And you can also delete your rolling cache file uh, on the go, but it just means that the next time you log in, it's gonna take a bit more data bandwidth to be able to load everything up. All right. Finally on to is the manual cache. And this is probably a big one that we want to talk about because um, as I've talked about, a lot of people sort of say, you know, well, I, I, let's say you, you will primarily only fly in one particular area and you don't want to have to worry about streaming it all of the time. So what you can do is you can actually preload or if you, want to, if you know you're going to want to fly somewhere, you can preload where you're going to fly. So what you need to do is, so is in order, you, there's a couple of things you need to just set it up. So the first time is you go to view. Now, initially, when you check on this, you have to set the location of it. So I created another folder just to show this off, which is a manual cache folder. Okay, just to show it off. I set how big I want the cache size to be in gigabytes, and you can modify it, change it, set it, whatever you want to do. Now, how do you actually cache the region? Let me show you that one. So let's pick somewhere. So let's go to, let's go to Bruges. Um, okay, so it'll search by airports. Um, okay, so we go there. So let's say I'm going to fly out of there and I want to go around here. Now, let's go, we want to go cache new region. Okay, now the closer you zoom in, the higher the quality of the cache. So if I just zoomed in from here, it'll only do like fairly low res imagery from here. Okay, but I'd still need to stream the high res imagery. Or I can stream, go zoom into here and I can stream the high res imagery. All right, so to pan around the map, it's left click and drag. And then to brush mode is right click. So we go, let's say, let's start here. So we go right click and hold. Let's draw a map, you can just draw that here. There we go. And then just draw a bit more here. 
Now what you'll see as well is that we'll zoom out here in a second, but I just want to do a little bit more of this one. So do that. So each one of these are sort of um, photo tiles, essentially is what this is downloading. Uh, so let's go here, we'll paint a bit more. Unfortunately, you can't, it doesn't sort of scroll with you as you drag, unfortunately, which would be, which would be nice. Uh, okay, let's do this one. Just want to sort of make that one there, and then we can go, okay, so I want high res of that. And then high res of that. Fill that one in. There we go, so that's my high res. Now, what you'll notice is that it also has these two other shades as it goes along as well. So as well as downloading the high res tiles all the way in the way in there, it'll download medium, medium res tiles on the periphery of it and then low, res on the low resolution on the periphery of that. So as I said, it might take you a bit of time to paint this, but this allows you to download it all. So let's quickly, uh, do a little bit more of the city of Bruges. Let me get to high. There we go. That's high there. Okay. That one there. There we go. And then do. So let's say I was just going to mostly do some bit of bit of sightseeing over that town. And that's all I really wanted to do because I, I knew I was going to be going offline for a bit, but I wasn't going to be flying for much. Okay. There we go. Okay. So there we go. That covers that. And uh, we should probably, I suppose, cover off our airport as well. So let me... All right. You get, you get the idea. You get the idea. Let me just quickly cover off the airport though, because otherwise... Somebody, up, somebody on this video is going to get upset if I don't cover the airport and the approaches. Uh, okay, and then... Not there. Cool. Okay. Then what we do is that we name it. So we'll name it... Uh, YouTube... Bruges. Pretty sure it's the town of Bruges. And then we go finish and download. And it'll take a few minutes while it goes through, grabs all that data and pulls it down for you. And once that's all done, it's there and available for you. And that's it. And there you go. Now the other great thing is, is that if you, even if you don't know exactly where you want to look for, um, you can just simply do it on a global map. You just zoom out and go, right, okay. I Next I want to download, let's see, I want to get an area down here. I want to get this island here, for example. Let it load, and it would do it there. Now, if you want to snap back and say, oh, where was that region that I downloaded again? Do I want to keep that? Press the little eye here, and it'll zap you back to that region and show you exactly what you covered off and the different levels of quality. So there you go. That is the manual caching process done through here and lets you know, again, it counts down how much uh, space you got left as from the spouse that you give it. So there you go. That is how you manually cache your high resolution photo reel information for being able to fly offline. So that finishes our data tab. Now we move on to our flight model tab. Um, I'm gonna just straight up say to this one, don't change it. Just straight up don't. Just don't. Um, and I'm going to leave it at that. I, I really am. If you desperately want to, this um, this removes this the current flight model, which is actually brilliant, and gives you the old, painful on-rails one that FSX uses. Okay? Don't. And I'm just leaving it at that. If you desperately want to, click there, and it'll slide across, and it will throw you a warning. But just don't do it. Um, all the other stuff in here, those we'll cover those off in. They are covered elsewhere in this, in these settings, but not here. So yeah, leave the flight model alone. Miscellaneous. Okay. Um, again, pretty much does what it says on the tin. Uh, so you got sort of, sort of you know legal credits, credit stuff like that. Lingu language, what settings that you have. Um, you have to restart the sim to change it. What it is defaults to English US. That's all you change there. Um, 
the avatar and copilot avatar are kind of cool and neat little settings this one um so there are a variety of male and female avatars of various uh races and styles of clothing are included um so very very uh sort of great options there you got 24 20 yeah 24 different options obviously pilot 24 uh split across male female um of various uh, male female and gender neutral um throughout these in different outfits and i think it's pretty cool um the only thing that's a bit of a shame, and sort of goes back to sound a little bit, is um, that it doesn't have any... Th there's only male voices in the sim, which is actually kind of disappointing. I'm kind of disappointed about that. Um, I was generally would have expected um, uh, female voices, and I was really disappointed when I didn't hear it. I don't, I don't hear any female voices in the sim by and large. The, the, there isn't a female instructor in the the flight lesson, the flight school lessons, but um, there's no um, uh, female voices for ATC or for in sim. Now that might be a thing with Azure, I don't know, but yeah, there's no settings for that, which is a bit of a shame. Um, otherwise, yeah, that's it. An instructor again, you can choose uh, um, a, a different avatar for the instructor or just leave it set to default which is the one that ships with the mission so that's it uh accessibility uh this is kind of cool this one so you can change things like text sizes the interface the scaling of the interface here that we're looking at tool tips so in your ui whether you want them turned on or off this doesn't affect your in sim experience this is purely for the accessibility of the ui and the menus uh how opaque is the background your main color so you can actually change these to like high contrast colors as well um there's a whole heap of colors coming through here um uh yeah i i kind of like the soft blue i like the blue i i actually would have liked a green actually i would have liked a soft green but yeah eh, that's fine many animations does things like uh, is the background active like it is here like we've been seeing in the back here um pre-flight cinematics uh so uh, some people don't like them i don't know why i like them i think they're cool they tell a story so this is when you, after you click fly and your sim has loaded, then you're presented with a vision of the airport uh, and the aircraft that you're about to, the airport you're about to take off from, the aircraft you're about to take off with. Um, it's a little bit of animation. You can skip it straight away if you want to, but it's not kind of nice and cool. And I don't know, for me, it helps sets the, sets the tone, sets the scene. Um, I like it. I think it's cool. If you desperately don't ever want to see them again, um, Turn to get to there. Turn this to on, and you'll skip all those pre-flight cinematics. But why would you want to? Uh, finally, developer mode. I'm not going to go into this one at all here. Um, if there is a desire for me to go into it, I'm happy to. Um, but for now, unless you're a dev, or yeah, you probably don't need this too much. But if there is a desire, if people really, really want us to go into this, me to go into this mode, please let me know in the comments in, the, in, the, in this video, um, and I will look into it for you. But otherwise, that is your general part of your options menu. All right, next up we have assistance. So assistance is pretty much what it says on the tin. It's it's how much does the system help you? Um, what kind of experience do you want? Now, overall, there's some um, overall tags that you can sort of, again, sort of, you can see read them in the description there as well. So you can either go, so a couple of, you know, default options, all assist. So if you're, if you're new to flight simulation, if you're new to, to, to virtual aviation, I would highly recommend that you start with all assists on, okay, as you get to know the sim. Once you've got to know the sim for a little bit, then probably start switching either, again, the, the overall sort of catch-all ones, or maybe start looking at tweaking individual things as you go along, okay? Um, but yeah, I, I would suggest starting with all assists on. But let's go through all the major breakdown ones as we go along. So piloting, takeoff, auto rudder. Um, if you don't have a rudder pedal, set of rudder pedals or a twist rudder on your, on your flight stick, turn this on. Um, because this sim actually models the impact of air, of airflow and power of propellers and asymmetric thrust, it actually models it correctly. So unless you're used to it and know how to counteract it, it will throw you off and you will want this on. 
Assisted yoke um, is assisted for your main pitch and roll um, when you're flying. Will it help you and sort of aid you if you're not pulling hard enough or whatever? It, will it help you do it? It'll help you along the way. Um, assisted checklist. I actually use this on because this is kind of cool because especially when you're running in two-seat aircraft, um, this is normal. So, you know, you'll have one uh, of, the, of the flight crew will be reading the checklist. One will do it and they will confirm with each other once the item's complete. So actually this is also a really good training and teaching tool. If you want to learn, you can do this one. So it, you still have to do this checklist. The, it, the AI doesn't do it for you. You still have to do the item, but it will guide you and help point you along as you go. Assisted landing, will it, will the sim automatically handle gear, landing gear flaps when you're on final approach and stuff like that? And take off, will it automatically clean the aircraft up once you take, once you take off? ATC, delegate ATC to AI. Do you want to not have to worry about comms and do you want AI to do it for you? Honestly, I usually do this. I actually usually turn this one on because I'm terrible at talking to the to the ATC. Um, but also, I just, I'm here to fly. Um, so yeah, I, I can't tend to fly this one on. You don't have to, you just do it manually if you want to. All right, next is on to aircraft systems. So um, a lot of these ones, are, these ones will be familiar to anybody who's done the ESP, ESP sims before, auto mixture. A few people have been asking me what is mixture, particularly people who might not be too familiar with aviation. Mixture is the fuel air ratio in the engine. Um, so, in order to make th an engine go bang, in order to drive, you know, make things explode inside an engine to give you power, you have to have fuel and you have to have oxygen. Funny story, the higher up you go in altitude you, altitude you go, the less oxygen there is in the air. You know, you've probably heard you know, altitude sickness, you know, when you sort of, if you climb up high mountains and stuff like that, um, there is less oxygen up there. So you need to have uh, what's called, you lean your mixture out, which means that you put less fuel in there. So you have more air in there to get the same ratio of air to, of oxygen to fuel. So that's called lean, uh, leaning out your mixture. Uh, mixture and being rich conversely is that you sort of push more fuel into the mixture than uh, than air. If you are unfamiliar with or with mixture, or if you don't know how to, li how to listen to the tone of the engine to see how it's firing to be able to adjust that on the fly, turn that on. Okay, it, it, it just just turn it on, um, and t as you get used to it, watch what the AI does with the mixture as well, because that you will see it move in the cockpit for aircraft that use uh, mixtures or chokes. You can see it and you start to get a feel of, uh, of uh, how it changes. Unlimited fuel does what it says on the tin, means it doesn't have any fuel burn. Aircraft lights is, will the aircraft, you know, will the, will the lights in the aircraft automatically turn on and turn off as required when it's day or night? Gyro drift is interesting. So as you're flying, your, most of your, your, a lot of your instruments in your aircraft are driven by gyroscopes um, that every now and again need to be recalibrated. Now, as you're flying along, they will go out of sync with the, especially like your ones of your uh, to do with your heading. So every now and again, you'll need to look at your compass and your um, heading indicator and make sure that they are the same. And then you have to uh, adjust them if they're not. Um, by default, yeah, so yeah, this is not on. You have to do it manually. There is a hot key that you can press to automatically do it for you, or you actually look at your compass and then you adjust the knob on your systems. Um, new pilots, I would seriously consider turning that on just for a while, just while you get started. All right, failure, failure and damage. So, um, top three uh, are, have been, are, are familiar for anyone who's been flying the ESP Sims before. The, the fourth one is new. Crash damage. It, uh, if you hit something solid, will it end your session? Yes or no is basically what that is. If cross stress it damage is, if you do something stupid with your aeroplane, will it end your ses session? Yes or no. Uh, engine stress damage. Will you, if you do something stupid with your engine, like you know over torque it, uh, overcook it, you know run the ITT too long, will you blow it up? Basically, that's what these three means, and end your session. Yes or no? That's that's what those three mean. It's really simple, but there you go. Icing effect. This is new. And this is really cool. Um, this sim models the weather and models icing conditions correctly. Now, you have two settings for this, visual only or on. Visual only means that the visual effect of you'll see the ice appear both you know, around your uh, windows and on your airframe. You'll see if you fly through um, conditions which would uh, where icing would happen, you'll see it visually, but it won't affect your 
Uh, if it's visual only, you'll see you'll see the ice appear, but it won't do anything to your airframe. If you have it set to on, and you have icing conditions, and you have this, and you get and your aircraft ices up, the aerofoil will be disrupted. You will take a performance impact on the aircraft, and you will potentially fall out of the sky. Um, I tested it; it works. So just be aware of that. Um, so I recommend flying with it on, but again, if you're a new pilot, you may want to turn it off while you're getting started. All right, on to navigation aids. And this is where there's some really cool stuff in here as well. Okay, route and waypoints. So if you have a flight plan planned, uh, the, the routes and the waypoints along your flight plan, um, are, will they be represented, represented in the world? Will you be able to see them at the correct al altitudes and stuff like that? Taxi ribbon, will, the, uh, will your path between your parking and the runway or between the runway and where your parking is, will that be represented in the 3D world? Um, I often use have it on because I don't have all my airport charts. Landing path, so this is a visual indicator of coming into land. Now this is a really interesting one and I think a really, really good training tool. So this one, not only does it give you a visual representation of the path of things like flying a downwind, a, a crosswind, a downwind, and an approach path into like all the way down to wheels down on the, on the, uh, on the runway, It'll also give you feedback about your speed, your attitude um, along the way. So if you're too fast or too slow, it will tell you both by changing the color of the boxes that you fly through and actually give you text if you're extremely too fast or too slow. So I think this is a really good training tool and a great thing for every now and again, even for more experienced pilots to be able to use, to get used to, to be able to sort of say, how are you actually going compared to what it really is? Uh, smart cam, we, could have, we talked about this earlier in the general settings with smart cameras. Um, do you have to manually press the smart cam button to be able to have it triggered or if you're within a certain distance of a, of a, like a point of interest marker or a city marker or something like that, will it snap your camera to look at it? Um, I would highly recommend you leave this set to manual, just personally. Um, all right, uh, the markers, the final four markers here, pretty much they say what they say, they say what they do on the tin, um, but it's kind of interesting, kind of cool. Um, so point of interest marker, city marker, airport marker, fauna marker. So will there be a, a visual represent, a visual sort of cue in the in the in the world that says, hey, this is the city of Stuttgart, um, or this is the Taj Mahal, or this is where um, you can find seagulls, a flock of seagulls flying around, or this is where um, Brisbane International Airport is located. You can turn these on or on or off as required. Um, I oscillate between them. Usually, probably I'll be leaving them on mostly just because of showing off on some of these, video, these preview videos. I'll probably normally fly with them turned off, except the fauna markers. I like it when I see those and they pop up out of nowhere, so they're kind of cool. Uh, but yeah, these, as I said, adjust these as required, and some of them might be good things, as I said. I think a lot of them make good training aids. Next one is on notifications. Um, so these are sort of this is sort of like the hints and tips system basically of how do you how to fly an aircraft how to use the controls if things should you should you should you consider leaning a mixture uh should you um you know should, should you watch your altitude should you watch your altitude stuff like that like these are just general things about are you while you're learning aircraft systems it might be a good idea to have these turned on um Objectives one is things like, you know, do you want to have the on screen? These are actually always, the objective ones actually, as long as you've got a flight path or a flight path chosen, they'll always actually be there. Um, but they're just hidden away in an objectives menu. Otherwise, this will actually have them pop up and stay in your face if you want them. Again, see so these things probably, these things would be good while you're starting to learn as you're starting out. As you get more familiar with it, you're probably happy to move those off to the side. User experience um, is, the kind of obvious are your panels open there's certain like the, the ATC panel checklist panels are they open when you first enter the cockpit um, does the ATC have voice yes or no like it's pretty obvious stuff um, yeah I don't know if said they, they, these all do what they say on the tin so there you go okay that's the assistance menu as a lot more cells a lot more contained than the um, uh, general menu so let's apply that one all right, finally, we have controls. Now, controls is probably where there's been some of the biggest changes to how things are done. And now, I've done a controls video previously, but a, a, fair things, a fair few things have changed about 
how it's laid out and how it is, how it, these are things are handled. So I wanted to make sure that I cover these off again. All right. So the first things first is that you have all of your controls are listed horizontally across the top here. So I have quite a few different peripherals connected um, and they're all sort of laid out for me. Couple of things to note. Um, so let's probably start with, uh, you know what? Let's start with the Hotaz Warthog. Okay. So if it's a fairly well known peripheral, um, it will actually, there'll be a picture of it appear here with a like all of the buttons actually highlighted to show what they do. Now we're just going to click on the expand collapse all here. So this by default, uh, oh, there we go. Um, so the default profile will have a series of different setups already done. Okay, and you just go through, there they are, everything's done. Now, let's say for example, uh, that, um, you know what, that's cool and all, but I don't want my flaps to, now, okay, actually, let me rephrase this. Actually, we'll focus on something else first. So let's say I have, okay, I'm looking at this and go, okay, button seven, okay, so, or if I was looking at that and I go, okay, so let's say I wanted to go search by input. So if I didn't have that in image there, so I'm going to press uh, button seven. So you can actually search by input. So I'm going to press button seven, okay, and it'll highlight what it is. So you, as I said, so I'll do that again. So in order to activate these search boxes, you click in them, make them active, and then press a button. Now, for example, button two, nothing's assigned to it at the moment. So let me try the number seven one again. There we go, and it shows up for me straight away. So this is a really nifty fact here that you can actually search by input. If you, or you can select the input from a list there, but as I said, it's kind of easy often just to go search by input because then you're actually pressing the actual button that you press and you know exactly what it's going to be. Now let's say for example here that the, uh, where are we, where's a, where's, a, where's a good example here? So let's say for example that decrease flaps. Okay, so decrease flaps is number seven. Let's say, you know what, I don't want number seven, I, I don't want to have decrease flaps used on my stick because I have a throttle for that. So let's say I want to delete that. So I want to go clear current input, okay? And I go validate. Now. What it did is it now asks, prompts me to create a new profile. That is because the default profile cannot be changed. It essentially is there to give you a baseline. So you can always come back to whatever my, what Microsoft believes is a good compromise, a good set of controls. So you can actually go through here and actually go through and set this up and go, okay, so let's go. I want to go to a um, joystick uh, test profile. Okay. And then you go, okay. And it'll then now save that. And I'll so say, I will now clear current input. There you go. Because I don't need to have my flap controls on that because I don't need them. All right. Now let's say instead that I want to set that to um, arm my spoilers. So you might say here, oh, but no boy. There's, this list is really short. Where are all the other things that this sim can do? Where do those ones I just deleted go? Great question. There's a filter here by default that says assigned. So if you switch it over to all, then every single control that you can set in this sim becomes available to you to select. There is a lot, a lot of things you can set here. Like you can set, uh, set axes, all sorts of stuff. It is absolutely crazy. Um, so it's just amazing, like just a stupid amount of stuff there. So let's say, okay, let's say, what did I say? I said I want to do as spoiler. So let's go type in spoiler. Okay. So this is anything then that has the word spoiler in the, the, the control, the uh, control name. So I want to set seven to be, um, to uh was to arm spoilers okay so i want to toggle arm spoilers okay so i then go to to set it i then click on the search by input i then press the key i then go validate and that's it done 
that's all I need to do. I can then also do a toggle spoilers. So we'll just do that again. Search by input. There we go. And done. Now what I can also do is let's just clear that for a second. So let's say I pressed uh, that one. Now it will say, hey, hey dummy, you've already got that button assigned to something else. Are you sure you want to bind it to this? Because you can. You can assign the, uh, one button multiple commands and it will execute all of them simultaneously. So we go, you know what, you're right Sim, I don't want to do that so let me just clear that there. Okay. Instead I wanted to set that key, I go validate and we're good. Cool, that's it. Um, now a great example now, I probably I wanted to want to do is I go over to the throttle, my throttle now to show you some of these. Um, so for my Hotaz Warthog uh, throttle, I have a variety of different, uh, yes. um, I have a variety of different profiles set. So this is the one that shipped with it, which I found didn't really work for me. Okay. So what I did instead is I set up a series of other profiles. So for example, uh, actually I should probably go back. Let me show you, this was the default one, okay? So default profile, uh, ooh, let me go change that to assign, there we go. So the default profile had my mixture access set to that slider and a throttle access set to that slider. Okay, cool, great, awesome. Um, but that didn't really work for me because in I still had an axis that didn't get used. And in my GA aircraft, I want to be able to control the prop axis as well. So what I have in my GA aircraft is that I have my, so I went to my, actually what I did is I went to preset manager and I went duplicate. And then I turned it into this role GA one. Um, and what I did is I added in my propeller axis. So now I have the propeller axis to be able to control as well. Um, so yeah, th this is, and then you can have all these profiles. So I've got a variety of different profiles here. So I've got a turboprop profile. Uh, I should probably just remove that Warthog now name from there. So actually that's a great thing. We'll go back and have a look at this preset manager here. So preset manager allows you to duplicate the profile. So if that profile is pretty much correct and you want to use it, but you want to change a couple of things for a certain aircraft, then you can go duplicate. And then you, same as we did for the setup of the profile before, you type in the new name, save, done or you can rename. So in case we're gonna rename this one now, so we're gonna go, just gonna go throttle turbo prop. There we go. Or you can clear all the key binds that are in it. You can reset back to the defaults or you can delete the profile. That's pretty much, that's pretty much it. Um, so you can go through as I see, you can see as here, I've got a twin jet one where I cloned my um, twin one but then I, I sorry, I created a twin one, and I struggled for reverse thrust, um, and I put it in spoilers because my jets have my biz jets have spoilers. Um, now, probably a good example for this one, I think I have, I, yeah, I have a quad jet. So this is another great one. So this is where I want to talk to you about how you can assign multiple things. So I was talking to Paul about about throttles. So as you can see here, my left throttle. So this one here. I've assigned that to both throttle engine of engine one and engine two, which is my engines on my left wing. And then throttle, uh, my right throttle is assigned to throttle engine three and engine four. Okay, so which is the engines on my right in, on my right wing. So this is the kind of, this is where you can, uh, this is where assigning multiple, um, the same control input to multiple items can be really beneficial. And this is something that you couldn't do in previous generations of this sim, um, of the Microsoft Flight Simulator family. So this is uh, some really awesome uh, improvements that have been made here. So there you go, I, says I want to share that with you. Now, last thing, I'll probably just to show you how to delete a profile. So what we're gonna do here is we're gonna go, uh, we're gonna close that one there. Um, so let's go to preset manager, because it was just a test one. So we go to preset manager, and this is how easy it is to delete a profile is if you go delete. Are you sure? Yes. Done. That's it. And you're done. And we go apply and save. And that has been a full tutorial. Oh, probably actually should, while I'm here in controls, let's actually have another quick one. Uh, let me jump over to... Uh, actually, we should probably do a key. Let's do a keyboard one because a few people talk about that. Um, so I have a keyboard profile. 
Um, so let's say, for example, that uh, you want to, let's say you, your throttle cut, you want to make, let's say you want to make that, or actually, no, eh, here we go, brakes actually is a better one. So this is what I wanted to show you here because I just realized I've actually done this. So um, it respects left and right controls is what it does. It respects both. Um, so, and I believe it also, let's say we want to, re let's say we want to, we want to rebind this. So we want to make this something else. So we go clear current input and okay. It will respect multiple commands that can be input there to be able to execute the command. And there we go. And there it is. That's how simple it is, guys, to be able to check stuff out. Uh, I'm going to change that back to this one. Uh, whoop. Well, that's not going to be a good one. There we go. And validate. But yeah, that's that's it, it does respect multiple modifiers, multiple keys together. You can string multiple keys together, but they all have to be pressed simultaneously. And it does respect left and right controls. Right, that's it. Uh, I'm not going to apply those changes because I don't want to change, but that's it. That has been your options menu for Microsoft Flight Simulator. As I said, this has been a very in-depth video. I know it's taken a long time, but I really wanted to take this time to show it to you in all this detail because there is so much going on here. And I think sometimes we go a little, we gloss over a little bit all these things. So I wanted to be able to showcase this in a bit more detail. Well, folks, uh, that does wrap up this uh, video today. Thank you very much for joining me. Uh, if you like the video, please uh, don't forget to like the video and subscribe to the channel if you're enjoying this content and would like to see more. And you can also support me and the work that I do by uh, supporting my work over on Patreon at patreon.com forward slash Noblewing24. All right, folks, thanks very much for watching. Take care, safe skies to all, and we'll see you on the next time. Bye for now.